Well, Big, you have some, like, congealing wet cat food there in the bathroom you can use. Oh, yeah, that'll be good. This is the Empty Nights Halloween. All right, everybody, welcome. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And this is the 13 Nights of Halloween. All right, yeah, we're back with the final episode of this year's 13th annual 13 Nights of Halloween, everybody. Third annual. It's it's the hey, don't knock it. <laughs> it's uh, it's our post show episode. Uh, we're going to be discussing yesterday's audio drama. What was the title of that thing again? Why can't I remember it? From another world, right? Yes. Is that too obvious a title? No, it, it works for it. I think it, it's good. I just uh, since I've only seen it like once. I have a hard time remembering it for some reason. So anyways, we're back with our uh, audio drama from Rish Outfield, which is different. I mean, it's not what we normally do, uh, audio drama. Why, Rish Outfield, did you decide to go audio drama instead of just writing a short story? I don't know. It just seemed like it would be fun. It would be a challenge, and it would feel uh, different than just us doing a story. Um, I was I was planning, and I, it's a tradition now that I, I always write something for our 13 nights of Halloween. And when I was planning it, I just thought, oh, wouldn't it be neat if we did it as a... I'm trying to think of an audio drama that I really like, that, I've, that I, I listened to around August when I, I came up with this. But Okay, so obviously this owes a lot to Who Goes There by John W. Campbell, which was the basis for the 1950s film The Thing from Another World which was remade in 1982 as The Thing. And so th uh, that was sort of my jumping off point. I had heard an audio drama of Who Goes There? And I thought, oh, I'd like to do something like that. And so I ripped it off. <laughs> Hence the title. Um, that laughter is, is Brian Lincoln. Did we introduce him? Oh, you know, I don't know that we did. Um, just to remind everybody that was listening yesterday, and if you didn't listen yesterday... You need to go back and listen yesterday because we're talking about the story that we did yesterday. So check it out if you haven't. Our, our guest star, one of our guest stars, I suppose, was Brian Lincoln uh, in that story. There was three main parts. Rish played one, I played the other. Brian played the third. And uh, yeah, we had Renee Chambliss do uh, a small part for us. But uh, she is not in on the conference call here today. It's just the three of us. Because we tried to read it live this time around and kind of act off of each other. And so, yeah, we have with us on the line, Brian Lincoln. Say hello to the folks at home. Hello, everyone. The title is a play on uh, The Thing. Um, so there's that. Yeah, I mean, it's got the body snatcher type of theme, so definitely it, it it's pulling from that one, but I don't know. There's there's other body snatcher horrors, too. I don't know if it has to, you know, it's not like a complete ripoff. It's just the same kind of idea, I think. Well, we, Big and I have a friend in common named Ian, and I've mentioned him many, many times, but he used to always complain when we go see movies that they end exactly where he would like them to begin. Right. And the ending of the 1982 thing, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, <laughs> right. all of the people at this um, this observatory or whatever it is up in in the Arctic have been killed or taken over by aliens except for two guys. They've blown up the whole outpost, whatever you call it, the, the whole uh, building, and they're standing outside around a fire knowing that once the fire burns out, they will freeze to death, but also, more importantly, not knowing if the other one is an alien or not. And then the credits roll. And a, a lot of people just love that ending. But I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, ah! And uh, a little part of me still says that when the movie ends that way. And so I think that was of an influence on me of, boy, it would be neat to see a movie that sort of started that way. Now, this didn't, but... That was the beginning of my idea for this story was just, uh, you know, some people together and, and, and is one of them an alien? Then it ends with a definitive ending. Yeah, I see what you're saying. 
take it one step further. Yeah, we we definitely figure out who the alien is by the end. So you don't have to go, uh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is that what I sounded like? <laughs> but yeah, that idea really interested me. I remember when you told me about it. Uh, I believe it was the night we recorded the episode for uh, the Empire State Building Strikes Back. And uh, in between the time, we got out and we just walked around the park that we were at and you were telling me the whole story. And uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of that, that starting from where uh, you wanted to, you know, the, 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 the Ian thing, saying, oh, okay, well, you want it to start right there. Well, then we will. It's almost like it's kind of like the sequel. <laughs> That's what I was thinking when you were telling the whole story of Ian. And I was just like, yeah. He says the movie ends right where he wanted to start. Well, then see the sequel, Ian, and just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, the sequel is never what you want it to be anyway. It, so. They'll set it up perfectly, and then the sequel will be a prequel. <laughs> the sequel will be their kids or <laughs> something corny. A lot of times they feel the need to reset the status quo in the sequel too. Yeah. So like the guy grabs the girl and they both love one another and they kiss. And then when it's time for part two, it's like, well, in between these two movies, they've broken up right. and gone their separate ways, which is always so frustrating to me. <laughs> yeah. You're like, what the, what? This isn't, what? This, what? <laughs> yeah. I hate that. And then Batman just says, it didn't work out. <laughs> I actually liked that little tiny reference to the last movie. So this was a challenge to me. I, I, I had two challenges here. One was trying to convey everything through dialogue. Right. And that's basically been a stumbling block for me. A reason I didn't want to do audio drama and didn't like audio drama is because I just, the power of the narrator to give you place and time and description is so strong. It's so useful in a story. And then the other challenge was, I wanted it to feel a little bit like it was from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Just the, you know, the thing from another world. I don't know if it was 51 or 54, but it just the way people talked. So I tried to keep it a little bit less modern sounding, even though I did put in, you know, sci-fi names, words or whatever. Those were my challenges. Is that a thing that's necessary with audio drama? Because, like, you guys were talking about Brian's uh, Hidden Harbor Mysteries, where you guys have made this appear to be a lost episode or a lost season of uh, a radio show that used to exist. Um, and then here you are doing yours, and you do the same thing, try and make it sound like it's from the 50s. Is, is audio drama something that can't be modern? Oh, it definitely can, but I think that some people become fans of audio drama because they like the old stuff because there's so much of it. Uh -huh. um, and it's kind of, you know, trying to imitate the roots a little bit. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do the old time radio style with every show I do, but it was a, I think it was a good good thing to do for the first show that I produced because it kind of, you know, forces you to kind of play around with that old style and kind of, I don't know if respect is the right word, but you become a bit more familiar with it. So you know where the audio drama type of thing came from. Brian, wouldn't you say that audio drama before podcasting was invented had become a lost art? It had all but died? Yeah, TV killed it off because um, it just was the preferred medium. Everyone, I mean, if you think about the old time radio, people used to sit around their living room around the radio and listen to it. And why would you do that when you can see people moving around? <laughs> you know, like it, it, even though the acting in, in a lot of TV shows was probably, it's kind of like starting over. I think the acting in radio shows back then was pretty amazing, but it's, it's harder to act in front of a camera than in front of a microphone. Uh, at least it's new when TV's new, right? So um, I think that radio was like really, really strong and then it's just suddenly didn't have the audience anymore. And it's only recently coming back. It's because these MP3 players or phones and things that everyone has, you actually have access to audio on the go. So you can 
multitask. You can listen in the car on the way to work. You can listen while you're doing chores around the house if you do them. And, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, it's just you can multitask, but you can't multitask while you're watching a movie. Not very easily. But with audio, you can. And so it sort of made a resurgence. And you have these really, really well-produced shows like like We're Alive, which is one of my favorite audio dramas out there that, that just finished up recently. And it's very, very well produced. It sounds like a movie and trying to show that this kind of entertainment is viable again. So it's a lot of fun to do. I, I really enjoy it. But is it more work than just doing full cast audio? Yes, it's a lot more. Um, it's a lot more because the the audio is the um, painting the picture. So the stuff that's going ar around in the background is painting the picture a lot more than when you don't have a narrator. Um, you know, when we do our our Dune Steve stories, you know, we can put in a sound effect of a gunshot. We can put some ambience in the background, but you're not really trying to necessarily, I mean, it's nice if you are really great with the effects, but at the same time, you know, with an audio drama, you have to like, you hear the sound effect, you have to kind of be able to tell where it is in the room. So if you're just taking a random sound effect of, of someone falling to the ground, whether the, it was recorded up close or 20 feet away, is going to tell the listener where it is relative to, you know, where the where they are as a listener standing in that room with all the actors. So it's a, it's a lot trickier to put all the pieces together in a way that sounds right. And because if you have, you know, a bunch of people recording in very different rooms and you put it together and then you have like gunshots that, or I don't know, some sound effects that were clearly recorded somewhere else because of the way they reverb, it just, it's so obvious that it pulls you right out. And we, you don't have the narrator to kind of break it up in the same way so it's it's the sound effect work is more that's for sure huh. you have to do a lot more on your own i think big is this intimidating you what he's saying right now hey rich is there any way we can go back and reconsider me doing this uh editing of our audio drama now that i've heard this uh answer to the question <laughs> <laughs> no it, it is more like i i mean i've done both and i and I I definitely found that it took me a lot longer to do audio drama. But again, you could have audio drama where every single footstep is meticulously planned out and recorded of everyone moving around the room in every scene, or you can just leave out footsteps, you know, depending on what kind of soundscape you decide to do. You can probably mask a lot with just having ambient stuff. Like in this story, there's like alarms and stuff going off, and that helps to kind of smooth out stuff. So it depends on how much you micromanage every single sound and every little thing that's going in in the room because you can always you can add add and add and do a whole bunch or you can keep it simple. Um, but the point is that it needs to be just it just needs to sound natural. So when the person's listening, they're not hearing a bunch of sound effects jammed together. They're hearing whatever is going on in the room. See, the the point for me is that I have to have this done by October thirtieth. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think with this story, it, uh, it's not super sound effect heavy. I mean, there, it's a lot of talking while they're in, in a room, and then there'll be a little bit of conflict, and that's just kind of where you'll focus on it, I would imagine. It's not too bad. Yeah, that's what I'm planning. Well, hopefully this works out. Hopefully people aren't listening to this post-show episode going, oh, I hope they talk about why it was such a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> So we get for recording these before it's been produced, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I have faith in you, Big. You, you've got, you know what you're doing with this stuff. Even if you haven't done audio drama. Yeah, I'm not worried. I shall do my best. Well, that's all we can hope for, man. I hope that the story itself was passable. It, it was difficult trying to balance humor and uh, suspense. Yeah. And I, I ended up shaving a lot of the jokes out. There were still a couple that I couldn't resist leaving in a, but Lawrence used to say all sorts of just idiotic stuff and the old man made fun of him and they, they bickered a lot more but at some point it's got to at least be a little bit scary it's a Halloween episode you know what I mean yeah yeah and I don't know big if you want to bring up uh you know the 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 scary ominous drone or whatever when uh, Lawrence <laughs> is telling his story I probably will that's uh, that's my crutch right there. I love that ominous, scary drone. <laughs> right. 
the premise, though, I mean, we, is something we've talked about: the loss of identity and yeah, you know, just the alienness, the 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 alien takeover thing has always been really scary to me. People that you trust, people that you love, aren't really the people that you love. There's something else. It's 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 hell. It's chillingly scary to me. Um, one of those things, you know, of the boy going upstairs to tell his mom about, you know, what he saw, and his mom isn't his mom anymore. Yeah, I've always liked the body snatcher type of, of story, too. Uh, and the slugs just adds a little <laughs> ick to it. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great storyline to use. I think I have, I have several uh, stories in mind. I can't, I'm not sure if I've actually written one of them or not, but I have several. The, the alien love story that we've referenced like a thousand times over the years in the episodes is one of those kind of stories where uh, someone has had their body snatched and yeah suddenly things are weird because of it yeah that that's just one of my fears you know that sort of thing of somebody that you can you know you can trust and suddenly you can't trust them anymore and and everybody i think fears a loss of identity it's something that we really value as our, our sense of individuality that that I am me and nobody else in the world is like me and I'm a unique snowflake. But somebody taking that away or somebody saying that you're not uh, an individual anymore is, uh, I don't know, just one of those basic alien, uh, sorry, those basic human fears. Ooh, I tipped my hand there. <laughs> yeah, and different ones do it in different ways, right? Because the, uh, the original thing was just, what was it? It was something that was inside them, right? I'm trying to remember. But like the Body Snatchers movies, they would like, there were the pods that would like make a clone of you, didn't it? Then they would kill you after that, after you were copied. Yeah. that That's the one that always freaked me out. <laughs> oh, yeah. The 1978 one or the 1956 one? Uh, I think the 78 one's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, that remains one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. I, I always watch it every two or three years. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, have you seen that one big, the one with Donald Sutherland? I haven't. I've only seen the 56 one. The 56 one is really good, too, but... It is a little bit dated, you know what I mean? Uh huh. And people tend to uh, read communism into that because the uh, it was in the fifties that it was made, and the lead actor's name is McCarthy. <laughs> but I don't know. The seventy eight one is is just it's scarier because uh, it takes place in the city. It's not out in the country or whatever, and people in the city are kind of cold and unfeeling anyway you know what i mean that you always hear the story of of the woman calling for help in new york and people just pull their blinds down yeah and yeah that there's something awful about that something inhuman about that of knowing someone is in danger is is suffering and you just turn away yeah that's interesting i was thinking about when you guys were talking about this whole body snatcher thing i wonder if there's a non-sci-fi basis to that like the person that you always trusted, that you always thought you knew, and then one day this person is not the person that you thought they knew. Not because they were taken over by an alien, but just because you didn't know them like you thought they did. Oh, well, certainly, I, I think um, Gone Girl is a little bit like that. You're married to somebody, and then later you find out you didn't know that person at all. Or uh, Stephen King wrote a a story that they just made into a movie called A Good Marriage, where a woman, her husband has gone out of town and she goes down in the basement and finds this chest of all of these mementos he's been keeping of his other life. And yeah, it's just the realization of, you know, I thought I knew my husband and I thought that he loved me, but something else is going on, right? I mean, although I guess if Stephen King wrote it, that's a... That's a genre story, too. Well, not necessarily. I mean, he's written stuff that are... I mean, it's horror genre, I guess, maybe, but not otherworldly horror, if you know what I'm saying. Well, Brian, can you su- can you suggest something that's not sci-fi that's like that? Uh, well, it is sci-fi. I was going to say Total Recall. <laughs> it's not a very good one, but he turns out that his whole life was an implanted memory, and suddenly his wife was a plant or whatever. But that's sci-fi, and that's not quite the same. But yeah, that's kind. Of, that's very similar. That's kind of like the whole time he's like, a- "What is the implanted memory?" He doesn't even know. Yeah. Like the whole way through, he's just trying to figure it out, and you know. Yeah. What is really me, and what is not? I don't even know anymore now. 
I think about that and just how much do you really know people? You know what I mean? Like I, me and Rish get together once a week and we talk on the dune steep and, and we hang out afterwards and we, you know, walk around the neighborhood and talk with each other and we talk a lot about stuff, but how much do I really know Rish or how much does he really know me? You know, if suddenly something weird happened, would I be able to say, no, Rish wouldn't do that. You're an alien. <laughs> You know, would I even be able to do that? Maybe I think I could, but, you know, I don't know. It's just an interesting thing. I mean, even just like me and my wife, how how well do I know her? I mean, she sleeps a couple hours a day, and she works many hours a day, and I only see her for, you know, a few of those hours a day. Would I know? Do I know her well enough, or could she have a totally different life like the guy with the chest down in the basement or whatever or my kids i think that a lot about them too well you need to find out if she's an alien you need to make her finish song lyrics just to check <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right i better i better make her pee and see what color it comes out <laughs> <laughs> and that part could have gone on and on <laughs> that that was so, that's i love that stuff of, of how do i know you're you and all that stuff it, I don't know if any of that was amusing. I, I I made poor Brian sing. And I think about a month ago, I emailed you and I said, um, Brian, you, whenever we go do karaoke, you won't sing. Is it because you won't sing or because you can't sing? Because <laughs> uh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> but that part at the end of the story, hopefully that that's a little bit chilling. The knowledge that you're that something is taking you over and you're not going to be you much longer. Yeah. Um, that's kind of awful. And, uh, you know, and so, yeah, he starts to sing the song because, you know, it's like a link to humanity, a link to earth, this song from, you know, 200 years ago or whenever Hey Jude came out. It was longer ago than that because Roland of Gilead was singing that song too. So that was another world, dude. Oh, Oh, yeah, I suppose. So, Rich, did you find it hard to write this? I know you've done those uh, those three guys around the uh, cookout type thing before, so you've written kind of funny dialogue before for the show. Well, yeah, and that stuff is easy because that's basically just what Big and I do on the Dune Steve. We, we write sketches all the time yeah, yeah. of little things that we think might be funny. But this was a lot harder than that, and I, I think part of it is – that I wanted it to be scary and I, it kept wanting to be funny. You know what I'm mm -hmm, saying? Mm -hmm. And, and like I said, I, I, I shaved a lot of the jokes out of there. A lot of the humor I had set up that in the future, Walt Disney was like a God to them was like, uh, not like a God, but he was like Jesus Christ. He was a, a, somebody who had come down and brought joy to millions of people. And so he had sort of been, uh, sanctified or, or whatever. And, and there was a little part about that. And and so there are still a couple of references. At one point, a character goes, "Wall, damn it!" <laughs> right. But uh, to make it scary and to make it serious, that was hard. And to try and convey stuff with dialogue was hard. But um, just writing, you know, lines is easy. I don't know. Have you either of you ever written audio drama? I mean, Brian, you you do tons of audio drama. Do you write it too? Uh, I I've, I've written. <laughs> part of a season of the show that i eventually want to do but it's not finished and it's uh probably not the next thing i'll do either so but i've definitely tried writing it um yeah it's 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 got its own challenge because you really want to have the dialogue like not be like so i'm handing you this cup and you're you know you, you're, you're trying not to force you, you want people to figure out what's going on without telling them too directly you know, so if you're interacting with stuff in the room, like the way you had people kind of in the closet, like shuffle around boxes and stuff, you you had sort of an indirect way to get them a sense of what kind of room they were in without someone saying, hey, this is a food closet, you know. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's the trick is getting it to the dialogue to be natural while still conveying the information you need to. Well, and see, I don't know that I ex I succeeded in that. But it has turned me off of a lot of the audio drama that I've heard of yeah. the modern stuff yeah. is because people will say, 
oh, look, here it comes. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a Packard. It's blue. It's, uh, oh, they're, they're, it's got some of those white wall tires. It's not a new car. And, and, and it's just like, oh, come on, guys. I, it, that always takes me out of it. Or my favorite is like, oh, tell me again what we just did, you know, to start <laughs> off the show. And it's like, well, I'll tell you. We were just, <laughs> and he tells the backstory, and you're like, why would they be asking you that? They just did it with you, you stupid. <laughs> I hate that stuff. <laughs> well, the uh, it, people you know. There you go. I was just going to say, people call it the as you know yeah. kind of dialogue. Exactly. And everyone still, do, I don't know. The good ones don't, but there's definitely a lot of people that still do that stuff. That's the trick is to really get good. I think, I just think writing scripts takes practice. I think you have to learn how to how to kind of set the stage without it feeling kind of forced. Yeah, writing's kind of always that way, though. It just it takes practice. That's why they say you got to write a million words or whatever before you become a, a great writer or a proficient writer or whatever it is they say. And I'm sure each different kind of writing takes a lot of experience, too. You know, you write, learn to write short stories or novels. Yeah. And, you know... But then jumping into audio drama, it's not, you know, like nothing different. You you have to learn how that medium works. And then if you're going to write in newspaper articles or whatever, a totally different style again. Yeah, I, I write audio dramas a lot faster because for me, the dialogue is the easiest part. Like I really have characters firmly in my head. And like when I write prose, I often have to go back. And when I do rewrites, it gets bigger rather than some people just write at you know at great length and have to cut down and cut down and cut down to get the story out of there but for me it's more like i move along too quickly and i have to go in and sort of fill in some of the detail um so for me the dialogue and is has always been easier it's just sort of what comes out but everyone's different i'm sure no i'm exactly exactly the are same you the same do you, you find dialogue to really be what what's at the heart of the story for you well, it's just the easiest thing, and yeah. sometimes I let the dialogue get away from me, and it just gets bigger and bigger. But I don't care because it's just so much fun to write dialogue. Yeah, uh, and yeah, it's all the stuff in between and trying to come up with actions of things they can be doing other than just standing there and talking. Yeah, which this thing was mostly just people standing there and talking. It's a lot of uh, pointing guns at each other and stuff. <laughs> Big, what is easiest for you, man? What is best in life? <laughs> to crush your enemies uh yeah you know dialogue is the thing that i i find myself doing more and more of as i do more and more writing it is what i like to do and uh yeah i have a hard time i don't know it's it's hard to rein it in sometimes because i think that is probably what causes a story to get bloated is when you have just characters talking on and on and on and on yeah you know what? I may have to go. The baby what? is screaming his head off outside the door. <laughs> Hold on. Screaming for you or, or? No, I think he woke up. Okay, I'm going to have to. You quieted him that easily? No, uh, she took him into the bedroom and I went into his bedroom. So now I'm across the hall and the doors are all closed. So I think uh, I won't hear him. I don't know what happened. Yeah, oh, let me see if I can pick it back up. I think that that is uh, like where stories can get bloated really fast is when dialogue gets out of hand. You know, if somebody just starts writing. Like recently, for example, I listened to Orson Scott Card's Ender series again. And there was a few times where I just felt like screaming. Because, yeah, he just had several scientists in a room... Just jabbering on and on and on and on and on and on. And I just thought, come on. This, you know, it, it, it reminds me of like Isaac Asimov's stories. If you, if you read his old stories. Where it's just people talking? Like, they're exploring. <laughs> yeah, it's like, here's two scientists. <laughs> and they're talking about something that just happened off screen. And they're con <laughs> conjecturing about what might happen off screen later. And then the next chapter things have happened off screen again and here's two scientists talking about now what has happened off screen but yeah i mean that's that's the way that you can you can bore people really fast with it but also it's generally the funnest part of a story as well so i don't know i i think i have 
I'm sure, a lot to learn about it. So I like to sit and write dialogue, and uh, sometimes I have to just punch myself so that I don't just keep going and going and going with it. And I, it's like, no, 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 okay, now is the time that the story should continue to happen. Yeah, I think that also comes out of a lot, out of the whole, what do they call it? Like if you if you outline versus pantsing or whatever people like to call it these days. Right. I think if you don't have a plan, or at least if you're trying to keep it loose to see where it goes, I think it's very easy for dialogue to be what runs you off on a tangent that you have a little trouble wheeling it back in but it is fun to write i have to admit i could sit and have people talk back and forth and try and be funny just not scientists um, right and so forth <laughs> yeah it, as long as only one of them is a scientist it's okay <laughs> if you get two scientists in a room oh no watch out <laughs> that's why we only invite you by yourself <laughs> yeah right hey brian can i ask you a question about being a scientist sure does it make it less enjoyable to watch a movie where they talk about something scientific or where there is a scientist. You know what I mean? Like Big can't stand it when it's something about the media, the news media, and it becomes totally fake. And I can't stand it when yeah. it's something about the making of movies. And I'll be like, the director doesn't use the, the clapper board, you guys. I, I, you know, is it like that with science? There are two examples that it's really been hard. One example is uh, Prometheus. That's kind of the classic because the scientists in that show were written by people that don't know anything about science. Just the way that they talk about stuff and, you know, the whole point of the characters was for them to, you know, decide they just have to have faith in things for it to work out rather than actually figure anything out, which is like <laughs> really bothersome to anyone who actually is a scientist. But the other one is uh, kind of more recent. Um, it's kind of, you ever have like... Uh, watch a tv show because it's so bad that you just have to see what happens next well the one for me has been the dome which under the dome yeah uh, under, under the, dome the dome has been so so stupid in season two it's like every episode is some sort of scientific way to solve and this teacher character they brought in oh i, I hate her so much <laughs> Um, and it's just the, the kinds of things that they do, like there's this one episode where there's all this soot kind of in the air and they're afraid they're going to choke because it's going to clog up the pores of the dome or whatever. So their solution is to build a giant windmill and then they spray a little bit of water at the windmill, which for some reason disperses it to clear the air when they already had the sprayer they're using to spray at the windmill, like... Like this, this, the way that things got added together to solve, quote unquote, solve their problems were just not thought out at all. And it was, it's just a bit yeah. painful because you realize that there are very, very fundamental physics things that they just don't know. They're just magic to them. Whether it's magnetism in one episode or just the way something would disperse in the air, you know, the math behind that, like it's not difficult. It's just, they're clearly not thinking it through when they're trying to solve a problem. All they need to do is ask somebody who, you know, went to college or something. <laughs> They'd probably <laughs> be able to figure out something that's a little bit more believable, but I don't know. Well, Brian, when you're around your friends, does that bother them when you are be like, oh, come on, guys, Newton's third law says, or whatever, does it limit their enjoyment to be with you? Uh, are you super nitpicky about bad science? I, I think the one that I probably would annoy people the most on would be time travel stuff. Because the, uh -oh. the idea of going back in time and changing, having a paradox is kind of absurd. And Right, but time travel is magic, right? Can can Are you able to just accept, okay, well, that's magic. The force is magic. It doesn't matter how it works. Or is it, are, you, are those two separate things in your it, mind and they can't both exist? It's a cause and effect type of thing. It's like if you it's kind of like a parallel universe type of thing. If you disappear in one and appear in another, you can have two of you in one universe and suddenly zero of you in the other, and it's still not a paradox. From the point of view of one or the other, suddenly there's two of you or zero of you, but there's never like an inconsistency in terms of the two of them combine kind of idea. So that's why that's why it always bothers me is this idea that going back in time does, it doesn't because ha you're it's going every, everything needs to be logical from the point of view of the person that goes back not to the point of view of the world 
that you're jumping around in, if that makes sense. Oh, hell no, Brian Lincoln. <laughs> there have been a few movies that have done it well, but not too many. So, like, Back to the Future. Yeah, it totally makes no sense. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good that I haven't watched that with you. <laughs> I still enjoy that movie. It's fun, but it's you just have to kind of let it go. And the other thing is, like, if it was something where you go back in time and you are in the same quote-unquote universe and, and are able to affect the future, just you going back and doing... Just you even being there will change the entire future unrecognizably it's not like a little subtle effect like if that was how it worked which it doesn't need to be but if that was how it worked then this idea that you have to go like you know kill hitler or something to really change history is not true all you have to do is like you walking through there change the local temperature you know butterfly effect stuff just enough that that next friday uh -huh. it rained instead of being clear and then somebody got in an accident you know what i mean like it it wouldn't even be that dramatic of an event it just would be immediately everything's different like certain little things would be suddenly different and then the conglomeration over a long the longer and longer you look out from the point that that you made the disturbance the less and less recognizable it is. The same way that it, if I want to tell you, if I want to predict the weather, I can tell you exactly what the weather is going to be like three seconds from now because it's going to be what it is right now. But I can't tell you what it's going to be like in two weeks. It's the same kind of like long-term right. effect of a complex system. So anyway, I think I rambled too much. <laughs> so you don't have to actually step on the button. No, just you being there, just you being there is going to change some local you know, temperature to an extreme decimal point that it has an effect on something that has an effect on something else. It does not need to be actually killing anything or anything like that. It's just some things would be robust against slight change and other things would be catastrophically different. And it's just uh, the world is a complicated place. So anyway, that's why it bothers me because it's not like you can go back in time and not change what happened later. Unless it's a totally different universe, then it doesn't matter. You may not want to read the story I'm working on right now called Do Over when I do finally get it finished. <laughs> hey, those stories can be fun. Like, like I really enjoyed the um, that story we did with Renee when we bent, went back over and over again to 1984. It's just when they're when the whole like if it's a a mechanism for a fun movie or book, that's fine. But when it's like trying to be really out of the box, like this is amazing and and it, the whole story is hanging on this idea of how time works, and to me it's immediately doesn't make sense, then it's hard for me to maintain interest, I guess. Okay. So st steering us back on course, <laughs> was there any sciency stuff in Rish's story that made you want to go blah? No, I mean, it's the kind of body snatcher type story. I think it's always been one that I like. No, I mean, it's obviously set in the future. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we get an exact kind of year or anything, but... There's obviously a spaceship, and there's um, they're on a space station of some kind. Uh -huh. But they still eat. None of the techno babble or any of the stuff. That's I don't know that there was a lot of it, but no, uh, I mean you have the. Just, I've got go. one. I use colony and station as the same thing. Mm -hmm. Is that bothersome to a scientific mind? Where you're just like, hey, a space station is one thing. A colony on a planet is something totally different. Come on, guys, they're not the same. No, it doesn't really bother me too much because you could start colonizing a planet by having a station there first and eventually terraform the planet below and start populating it. A colony could start on a station. All right. I, I gave you an opening there, man. <laughs> yeah, that's that's more like a grammarian's problem. How about you, Big? Did I find anything that needed to be changed in the techno babble? Uh, I don't, I, there was one time when you said dampener and I wanted to say, are you sure it's not a damper? But I don't know. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm not even sure what the hell a dampener is. So I just kept my stupid mouth shut. <laughs> I do much better as the dumb guy that doesn't get any of the nuance. That's why you got that part, big. Right, right. That's, that's what I'm saying. Actually, I I let Big choose which part he wanted, and he has no memory of ever choosing. So uh, I don't. That's true. That's funny. I was allowed to choose that, huh? 
I, I, being a scientist, Brian, are you more or less inclined to believe that there are other intelligent life forms out there? Oh, definitely more inclined. Yeah, I think it's silly to think there isn't. It's just that's that's not understanding how life forms and it's not understanding the scope of the universe to think that we'd be the only ones. Just statistically, it's likely, but the chances of us being close enough to see it is small, so it's not un, it's not surprising that we haven't seen any other life, but I think it would be very weird if there wasn't life everywhere. There was a time when, uh, you know, people talked about exoplanets and that they didn't know, they hadn't ever seen any exoplanets out in stars out there. And then one day they found some and then they found more and more and more. And then, yeah. you know, it seemed like at one point they were talking about like, why, why is our solar system the only one that has exoplanets? And then, yeah, they found them and then they found tons and tons and tons of them. And now... They don't talk about that anymore. I, I would even say that there's at least a decent chance that there's some sor form of primitive life had been on Mars at one point. Um, and that's just one, you know, the the easiest planet for us to get to, right? So it's, right. so I mean, to, to think that there wouldn't be many of them everywhere is, yeah. So Brian, do you suppose that eventually we will go out and explore the stars? That depends, because <laughs> technologically, uh, I could definitely see that happening. Now, my understanding of the universe uh, and the you know physical constants that are there, uh, I don't expect. You know, I could be proven wrong someday, but I really think that speed of light is a physical limit, right? So I, I really don't think even if you figured out a way to get ships to go very very fast. It's still going to take a freaking long time to get anywhere, <laughs> right? But it's likely that eventually we will mess up our planet enough to the point where we have to go. And if there are generation ships, you know, it's like, okay, in 300 years, we're going to reach X planet and we all go in different directions in these ships. When we get to a planet, a Goldilocks planet, and we get down there, is it more likely that life will have happened but is gone or that life will be in like some really 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 early stage i mean there's a lot of ifs there but if we were able to leave earth and go to another place that was similar enough to survive on i mean it'd be great if you can just land there and the atmosphere is perfect right and there's nothing on there that'll kill you instantly because <laughs> but um like a bacteria or virus or something but uh if you looked at a climate on a planet, it would pr really depend on the history of that planet's climate. Like Earth didn't necessarily get life because of the conditions on the planet. Now it developed life because of the conditions on the planet when it started, when the right stuff came together to start having chemicals combined to form amino acids and things like that, which are, you know, and things like DNA just kind of spontaneously starting up. Uh, it just takes certain conditions for that to happen. Um, and so if, if a planet has a long enough history in the right conditions, it's likely that stuff came together in a way that forms simple life that then evolution takes over and it starts developing. Um, but if it's also possible to find a planet that has a history that is not very compatible to life being there. So it could be currently very habitable, uh, hospitable, but not have ever had the conditions to for life to have started there. I mean, there's, you know, people have hypothesized in science fiction a lot, a lot about, you know, that whole seeding type of idea where, you know, life on a bunch of planets all came from space, jumping down planet to planet rather than having it spontaneously form on each planet separately. But, but yeah, I think, I think that it's possible but it's going to depend on the conditions there. I think it's very, I, I the thing I, I would jump up and say is not likely is for us to get off the planet because we did not treat it well, because I think that one of the side effects of really bad stuff happening due to things like climate change are not just natural disasters, but economic crashes. And if you have 
economies that are totally devastated, I don't see how you're going to be able to fund anything as ambitious as space travel, even if it's desperate. I have a hard time seeing, I think it's more likely that you end up with sort of ebbs and flows of population rather than steady growth like we've had over the history of the planet. Not to be all gloomy, <laughs> that's kind of my head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you need to scare us because these are supposed to be scary Halloween episodes. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so paint us a, a picture of doom and gloom that lies yeah. in the uh, future for our species. Everybody run and recycle too. Mm. All right. Well, I'm going to say that we've gone on long enough. <laughs> sure. Um, are you still there, Rish? I am. Okay. Oh, you just depressed me. <laughs> okay, so we're going to call this episode to a halt. We're going to bring our whole event to an end even, because this is the final episode of the 13th Annual 13 Nights of Halloween. Third. What? I'm, I'm, Nothing? I, oh, okay. Good. Anyways, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, it's been a good time. I hope you enjoyed all the episodes that we've done. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, it's been nice to, uh, with this final episode, be able to talk with Brian and for the rest of them be able to be here talking about this stuff with Rish. And I just hope that you enjoyed it half as much as we enjoyed making I, it. In which case? We've enjoyed it twice as much as you. I really like how we followed up talking about how not to have a story digress by having scientists talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> to me, just talking about top, random topics. <laughs> I think that was a very good right. illustration of, <laughs> That's of your right. point. We, just, we give them a live <laughs> demonstration of just how it could be. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Yanklevich. I'm Rich Outfield. Thank you, Brian, for showing yeah, thanks up. Thanks for having me. Cool. And uh, have a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons 3.0, attribution, no derivatives, share-alike license. That means you can't sell it, but you can share it with everybody. It also means you have too much time on your hands. Okay. Just come on, come on in. I'll just switch to his room. <laughs> Sorry. I'm turning off the light. Are you okay? Brian, I'll give you $100 if he says, Mommy isn't Mommy, Daddy. <laughs> She's something else.